My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am really glad you're here. I got up this morning. I thought, man, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to get on my bike and go for about a 30-mile uh, ride, and I thought, oh, no, i got to go to work. But the rest of you could have done that, and you chose to be here instead. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you're new to our church, I always like to say thank you for coming, and we have a card near where you're seated and if you fill out that information, we'd like to send you an email this coming week, this week, and uh, let you know of some of the opportunities we have here, and just make a connection. So uh, please take advantage of that. If you're first-time guest and you take this card out to the welcome desk, you'll receive a free gift bag with some goodies in it. On the back is a place for prayer requests. We get several of these cards every week. People put them in the offering plate when we receive the offering in a few minutes or at the welcome desk, and it is our privilege to partner with you in praying for these needs. So please take advantage of that as well. Uh, one of the best ways to connect in our church, especially in the summer, in the month of July, is family camp at Hidden Acres. At the end of this month, we'll have a weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, near Boone, Iowa, at Hidden Acres. We call this family camp. That doesn't mean it's just for families. It's our church family. So if you are a parent, a grandparent, or if you're a single person, just come on over to Boone, Iowa, and there is this large camp that our movement uh, helps to provide, and there are an incredible number of fun things to do there. We'll also be hearing uh, from a speaker that is well-known, especially among the men, uh, Terry Baxter, and uh, there'll be a baptism service in Letchler Lake. So uh, please sign up. If you go out this morning and turn to your right, you'll see the tables there, and you can sign up. Uh, some like to go out and rough it in a tent. Others like the motel rooms out there in Hidden Acres. So uh, take advantage. Uh, of course, the best way to get connected in our church are life groups, and uh, if you would like to get into a smaller group where you can study the Bible together and learn to apply the Scriptures and just do the one another's of the Bible, we'd love to help you with that, and you can talk to the folks at the welcome desk and they'll get you connected in a life group. We're going to pray and then receive an offering in a minute, but I, I want to say we are very grateful that our challenge students got back from Kansas City. They had a great time last week. And uh, we had uh, videos posted on the, our online community. You may have seen them. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to get a full report of what happened there. But uh, I've seen many of our students and our leaders back today, and it's great to have you back, even though I can see you haven't caught up with your sleep yet. But it's good to have you back. So let's just uh, take our needs to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you that we can be here this morning and celebrate all the things that you've given us because you are such a great God. You are a God who is great in justice. And in our world, there are so many things that are unfair happening. It's good to know that we have a God who will someday bring every act of wickedness to justice. Uh, but that frightens us a little bit because we realize that we also are accountable to you and we will receive your justice. So we also celebrate the fact that in your greatness, you're a God of mercy. You give us, you don't give us what we deserve. In fact, uh, even though you are a holy God, perfect in every way, and we are not, you loved us so much that you became a human being and showed your grace, your undeserved love for us by allowing Jesus to die on a cross as our substitute and rise again, proving that he is God and that those who humble themselves and trust in you can be forgiven. So, Lord, we just celebrate that and thank you that we can come here to be reminded of it because we need to hear that every day of the week that you forgive us. Lord, we live in a divided country, in a divided world. There's a lot of conflict, there's violence, and 
Lord, sometimes we wonder how you can be so patient with the human race despite what's going on here. And, and we just pray that as people who represent you, people filled with your Holy Spirit, that we could be peacemakers, uh, that when there is division in regard to politics or uh, gender or economics or race, that we could step forward as uh, peacemakers indwelt by your Spirit to speak truth and point people to you. And we pray that we could be your hands and feet on planet Earth. Lord, we thank you for the good news of the gospel that we can take, especially to our community. And we pray for our 52404 area. We were saddened recently to learn that the Iowa City, Cedar Rapids area has a spike in child abuse. It hurts us, Lord, to know that children are suffering. And we pray that as a church we could come alongside hurting families in the 52404 area especially and uh, give them encouragement and hope. Lord, we also lift up the people who, in our own church that are suffering. Some have cancer, some have chronic illnesses, some have uh, weighty decisions to make. Some of us need to find a new job. Others of us have a conflict with a family member, and we just need your help to figure it out. So, Lord, be with us as we seek your face this morning. We want to show you our appreciation by giving our tithes and our offerings. And we pray that these gifts uh, of uh, thanksgiving can be used as an investment in uh, bringing the good news to our community and, and the world. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, as that offering is going around, I just want to welcome our online community that's joining us as well. And uh, just remind you that the 52404 area is uh, under a prayer watch right now. We're, we're celebrating 10,000 prayer connections. Thank you for sending us your prayer times so we've been able to count them toward this 10,000 prayer connections. And if you need a reminder of how to pray for our 404 area, there are these cards in that little bin on your way out. Also, next Sunday at 10.30, you can join us in the bridge for a prayer walk. The nice thing about walking and praying is that you can keep your eyes open while you're doing it. It's dangerous not to. But uh, we're going to give some instruction, and then some of us will go walk in neighborhoods. Others of us will drive to different parts of our, our 404 area, and we're just going to pray for the people living there and asking God how to help us to take next steps to serving them. On August 1st, we'll be uh, unrolling our new um, plan to reach the people in our community. So um, please be praying about that. Have you ever noticed that some of the great classical literature has all to do about guilt? For instance, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. What a great story. It's hard to keep all those Russian names in your brain as you read this story, but it's about a man who thought he committed the perfect murder. And the rest of the book speaks of what goes on within his mind and heart as the police investigate this murder and begin to question him and the guilt that weighs upon him, driving him almost mad. And then another great book by Nathaniel Hawthorne called The Scarlet Letter. Young woman, Hester Prine, has become pregnant out of wedlock. And in that community in early America, she had to wear a big A on her dress, A for adultery. Nobody knew who the father was. That was the big gossip in the town. I wonder who the father is. The movie paints this woman who is a very classy lady because she will not say who the father is, but it's a young pastor in the community. And the book talks about his mental state as he wrestles with the guilt that he feels. The Scarlet Letter. And then there's the classic works by Edgar Allan Poe. 
a great author to read right before you go to bed at night. <laughs> Telltale heart. A man killed somebody, buried them in his basement, and as he goes to bed that night, he begins to hear the dead man's heart beating and beating and beating. Well, what's actually beating is not the man's heart, he's dead, it's his guilty conscience. So much of humanity and the great books of the world have to do with guilt. Why is that? Well, it's because we are a guilty people. We all wrestle with guilt. The reason these are classic books and read over and over again is because we don't always handle our guilt in the right way. Most of the time we try to manage it, we try to minimize it, we try to blame somebody for, uh, for it, we try to hide it, cover it up. And that has been going on since the beginning of time. The story of the Bible in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned against God, disobeyed His command, and the result of the first sin was hiding. They made fig leaves and covered themselves, trying to hide from God and hide from each other. And we've been hiding ever since. So we really need to talk about this issue of forgiveness. Can we be forgiven, and do we have any assurance that if we come forward and admit to our guilt, that God will forgive us? Can we know for sure? I want to talk about that this morning, and I'm so glad that a great person of the past is going to help us with this, King David. King David knew what it was like to be guilty. We think that Psalm 32, and especially Psalm 51, may have been related to his sin with Bathsheba. He committed adultery with this woman, hid it, and then murdered her husband, and he tried to keep it quiet, tried to cover it up, it's finally exposed. And we think that Psalm 51, which is directly related to that, may have a follow-up psalm in Psalm 32 where he celebrates the joy of forgiveness. It's a beautiful psalm. It uh, is called a mascal of David. The titles of the psalms are always a little confusing to us because we're not familiar with the term mascal, but mascal may be a Hebrew word related to wisdom. Psalm 32 not only talks about David's confession, but it also talks about wisdom on how to deal with the hidden sins within our hearts. Also in this psalm, you see the word selah come up three or four times. Selah may be a musical term. If you've ever played music, played the piano, played an instrument, or been in vocal choirs, you've, you've seen a rest stop where you take a breath. And a selah is kind of a breath mark. And we think that this was placed into the text to remind us just to think and to meditate on it, to take a pause, really reflect, maybe read it again. The psalm has four parts to it. The first one, in verses 1 and 2, he's celebrating the joy of his forgiveness. And then he gets into his personal experience of trying to hide his guilt and what that did to him mentally and physically and, and spiritually. And then he moves to the joy of forgiveness and the rewards, the unexpected rewards that come to opening his heart to God and confessing it freely, and the things that he enjoys because of it. And then the psalm concludes again on a note of joy when he talks about two pathways, the pathway of the wicked, which is continuing to hide sin and the sorrow that brings, as opposed to those who turn to God with open hearts, surrounded by the love of God. My prayer is that as we look at Psalm 32, that this might be a note of hope and restoration for you and for me. Some of us here are deeply burdened 
by hidden guilt, things within us, within our minds and hearts that we can't share with anybody. It could be uh, burdened by shame. We may not know how to eliminate it. We may be denying it. And uh, I know of no, no more complicated subject than the issue of forgiveness. As a pastor, the most common question that I am asked is how to deal with forgiveness issues. And so my task today is in 35 minutes, try to unpack what God says about it from Psalm 32. I wish we had four hours, but we don't. So we'll do the best we can. Would you please stand with me and let's read Psalm 32 and hear the wisdom of the ages for dealing with hidden guilt. Psalm 32, right in the middle of our Bibles, hear the word of the Lord. A mascal of David, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The Lord speak to us, we pray through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So he kind of starts out by asking us, do you know the joy of forgiveness? The word blessed, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. The word blessed means happy, joyful. Do you know the joy, the relief of having your sins forgiven? And he uses four words in those two verses to describe sin. First of all, he says, blessed is the one whose transgression. Transgression is an act of rebellion or disloyalty to God. The second word is sin. Sin refers to an act that misses the mark. So you have an archer, he's shooting an arrow, he misses the target. Sin, like an arrow, misses the mark of God's will. We aren't able to follow his will. And we miss the mark. That's why Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The third word is iniquity. Iniquity means to be crooked. A crooked or wrongful act that's often associated with the conscious intent to do wrong. And then the word deceit. Deceit means fraud, deceived, deception. If this is a progress of words related to sinful acts, self-deception is kind of the final result of hiding our sin. We're deceiving ourselves, blaming others, trying to manage our guilt, all the while suffering in self-deception. But the good news here is that blessed is the one who has sin forgiven. The amazing thing is is that God is telling us that all sins, great and small, acts of omission and commission, can be forgiven by our great God. 
There can be joy in a person's heart despite having committed the most heinous of sins. Sometimes people say to me, well, I think God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And I want to lovingly say to them, by making that statement, you're saying that you are stronger and more powerful than God, that the almighty God of creation who provided a way for you to be forgiven and you can't forgive yourself? See, our God wants us to enter in to the joy and relief and release of being forgiven. You know, that word covering comes up here in verse 1, whose sin is covered. Now, Adam and Eve covered their bodies with fig leaves, hoping to hide from God. We might look at that word and say, well, God covers our sin. And we think, well, does that mean that he kind of lifts up the rug and sweeps that dirt on me right under the rug and puts it down, kind of covers it up? But that's not what the word cover means. Cover is a rich biblical term that goes back to the days of sacrifice in the Old Testament. When someone committed a sin, they would bring an animal to the tabernacle or the temple. And on the Day of Atonement... A lamb would be sacrificed, blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat covering to cover sin. Now, the covering in that meaning is cleansing. So you bring an animal to atone for your sins, that animal becomes your substitute, it's killed, the blood is sprinkled on the atonement cover, and your sins are forgiven. They would also bring in a goat and... uh, The high priest would place his hands on that goat, symbolizing placing the burden of guilt of the whole community on that goat. And then they'd chase that goat out into the wilderness, the scapegoat. This is the meaning of covering here. David is celebrating the fact that when he goes to tabernacle worship, God covers his sin. But as we know from the book of Hebrews, that was a temporary means of, of cleansing because the next day you commit a sin and then you got to take another animal to be sacrificed. And so the author of Hebrews points out that Jesus comes as the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So when Jesus died upon the cross as our substitute, He, the only one who could live up to the law perfectly, He, the only innocent human being who ever lived, dying in our place as our substitute. And through His death and resurrection, our sins are forgiven. So when we look at this in our New Testament era, we say, blessed is forgiveness because of the covering of Jesus. It's an amazing thing that the Apostle Paul in Romans 4 picks up this theme when he speaks of Abraham being forgiven by God and reckoned as righteous because of his faith in God. And then in Romans 4, verses 7 and 8, he quotes Psalm 32. And he he talks about something called imputation, which is where God reckons us as justified in his sight, even though we're still sinners, because of what Jesus did. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. And because of that, God looks at us now as forgiven people. If you're not a Christian here today yet, my hope and prayer is that you'll come to the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again and find forgiveness. If you're not a Christian yet, where do you go to deal with the sin that grips your heart? This is a beautiful thing here, that God covers our sins. Of course, God is able to look and see the fraud within us, the deceit. And one of the things that happens to us is that one of the ways we manage our sin is to be sorrowful over our sin, but sorrowful because of the consequences rather than the fact that we've offended a holy God. And so, Sometimes people seem so sad because their sin has been exposed and they're crying. 
but it has nothing to do with sorrow over their sin and feeling the weight of the debt they owed God and the debt that was paid in Christ. God is able to see through that. And my prayer for you is that if you are hiding some sin and you're afraid of exposure and the consequences that would come, that you would come today to receive forgiveness Because if you don't, the consequences can even be more painful. David gets into that in verses 3 and 4. He says, I've experienced the pain of hidden guilt, and you may also be experiencing this. In verses 3 and 4, he says, I was silent. We know that for about a year he hid his sin with Bathsheba, if that is the reference of this psalm. He was quiet about it. He said, my bones wasted away. He physically felt the effects of guilt. I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy on me. He knew that the reason that the guilt was intensifying was because God's hand of discipline was on him. So that's the thing the Bible says is that those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. If you're feeling the weight of guilt, it's the hand of God, like the heat of summer. His strength was dried up, like the heat of summer, he says, because of it. Have you ever wondered why we're silent about our sin? Why is it that we hide it or attempt to hide it? I think we care about the way we look in the eyes of others, and sometimes we're afraid that if we come clean on something we've done, we're ashamed about, that the consequences will be severe, and they could well be. And so what do we do? We hide it. It's called sin management. We go into the sin management business, and we pull out the tools to manage our sin. One is to blame others. Well, it was their fault. If they hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done what I did. Or we minimize it. Well, you know, in the Bible days, that's the way God looked at it. But today, we live in a different world, and if God was writing the Bible today, He would change things. And we minimize it. Or we deny it. We try to go through it. Well, if I just forget about it and don't think about it. But it keeps haunting us. All these methods we're using to minimize, to condition ourselves. We think, I'll put this rule in place. I'll I'll try to, I'll I'll remove the app so I don't go to that particular site anymore. And then we're tempted again. Oh, we make that New Year's resolution. I'm not going to do that this year. And within three days, we're doing it. Or we make promises. Oh, I'll, I'll never do that again. And then we do it again. We stay silent. And it haunts us at night. And we ought to be grateful that it haunts us because the very fact that we're miserable is a sign of the mercy of God weighing on us. That's God's mercy. He places His hand on it. It's like the heat of the summer. got so difficult for David that he said, Finally, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you. It's really interesting to see the progress of confession in in verse 5. He starts out acknowledging my sin, he says. He agreed with God that what he had done was wrong. It takes a lot of humility to get to that point saying, you're right, God, what I did to become the judge of our own sin. He says, I didn't cover it anymore. I didn't try to hide it. Third, he said, I said to myself, I'm going to confess my transgression to the Lord. And then he said, you forgave the guilt of my sin. I like to read a a man named Eugene Peterson. Uh, He writes a lot about walking as a follower of Jesus. And in one of his books called The Jesus Way, he reflects on Psalm 32. And I thought he had a good word here. He said, The only effective remedy for sin is forgiveness, and only God can forgive sin. So if you're not a Christian here today, 
can I lovingly tell you, all your methods of sin management will not work. But God can forgive. And the only way to get in on God's forgiveness is confession. We have to open up to it, to God, and be honest, confess our sins. <laughs> our challenge students were uh, down in Kansas City, and they were receiving a fire hose of great uh, information and worship. Uh, I've seen the videos uh, all week long. I was wishing I was down there with them. It, it looked really exciting. But um, I don't know how many days they did this. They went out on a work project, and I saw our students and leaders working in the hot summer Kansas City sun, cleaning the brush out of this park area. And I heard many reports how hot it was. Uh, now, I'm glad that in Iowa we don't experience the heat of the summer like they do in Kansas City. I mean, who could endure 95, 96 degrees weather with all that humidity? I'm glad we don't have to deal with that here. But they did, and it got hot. And so there's finally a video here with two of our youth leaders. We won't mention their names to protect the guilty, but it was Karen and Mallory. And they're standing there, and all we see are their feet and legs. And Karen said, it is so hot, and oh, this cool water. And you can see this hose squirting their legs, and they're going, oh, that feels so good. Oh, ho, 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 ho. And I thought, that is a picture of the heaviness of sin and the relief of experiencing, as David did, the forgiveness of God. It comes like a cool hose, cool water on hot feet. Cool water on a soul filled with guilt. Why would anyone refuse such a thing? To come and confess and to acknowledge to God that our sins have offended Him. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well, if I'm a Christian, I've repented of my sins and been forgiven by Jesus, and I no longer have to confess my sins. And I go, time out. Let me just ask you a question here. Are you married? Yes, I'm married. Okay. If you offend your wife, does that ever happen? Oh, occasionally. You've offended your wife. Okay. Do you say to your wife, hey, we're married, get over it? Or do you finally humble yourself and fess up and say, I'm so sorry, what I said or did was wrong, will you forgive me? See, even as Christians, we need to have a practice of daily repentance and confession. Let me remind you that 1 John is in the Bible near the end, and it's written to Christians, and in 1 John, he reminds us of our need, even as believers in Jesus, for a constant daily confession of our sins. Where is that? Chapter 1. Look what it says in the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, but if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. He's writing to Christians. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. So what we learn from David is that a person who is a believer in God practices daily repentance and confession acknowledging our guilt and sin. My hunch is that a lot of Christians today are miserable because they're hiding their guilt. The Bible says, don't do that. That's our encouragement today. Don't do that anymore. Come clean. Confess it and receive God's forgiveness. You say, well, you don't know the consequences that are going to come. If I confess what I did wrong, I could go to jail. I could hurt my marriage. I could hurt my kids, okay? That's true. Even receiving the forgiveness of our God, consequences will go on. Let's not be naive about that. But have you ever considered the rewards 
that come to you because of forgiveness. David did. He talked about these rewards in verses 6 to 9. He said forgiveness brings unexpected rewards. First of all, he says, forgiveness, confession and forgiveness brings God's protective hand. Verse 6, therefore, drawing a conclusion here, let everyone who is godly, you say, how could David be godly? He committed, yeah, yeah. He's godly, not because he's a good person, but because God has forgiven him. It's because of God that he's a godly person coming to God for help. He's praying. He's saying, God, help me. Note the urgency here. Offer, God, offer prayer at a time when you may be found. The more we delay in confessing our sins, the greater harm to come. There's an urgency here. We don't have forever to do this. He says, come. And surely, even though flooded by a rush of waters, if I've been forgiven, I know that God is with me. And then he goes on to verse 7. In fact, you're a hiding place. You shelter me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of my deliverance. So he's saying that once I come clean and confess my sins and know I've got the forgiveness of God in my heart, then whatever comes, I know I'm surrounded by him. His protective hand surrounds me. I think there's a good word for us here. The reward of forgiveness is something that needs to be followed through immediately. Don't delay. It's a large influential church in the Chicago area. Our hearts are broken because many Christians and churches have been impacted by this church. But evidently, it's come out now that the pastor has been inappropriate with younger staff members, female staff members in his church. It's been going on for a period of years. Evidently, about four years ago, a group of people came to that church board, to their elders and pastors, and said, you need to take action because we're concerned about this pastor continuing this pattern of inappropriate behavior. For four years, this group of people waited and did not see the action. The board kept excusing the pastor. And finally, this group of people decided to go to the Chicago Tribune, and it's all over America. See, that's what happens. We hide our sin, and then when it's uncovered, this is why we shouldn't wait. Unfortunately, the church leaders supported the pastor and claimed the women were lying, and it became a defensive cover-up. One well-known New Testament scholar who is a professor in a seminary in Chicago and used to attend that church wrote a very honest letter to the board saying, we now have two narratives. One narrative is this pastor has been investigated, he's come out clean. The other narrative is these women who are crying out that he was inappropriate are lying. So he's saying, do we listen to what the board is saying, these women are lying, or do we listen to the women, many of whom are well-known, credible, godly women, do we dismiss them, or do we, which story are we going to choose? And I was happy to know that about uh, within the last two weeks, the church, the pastors have come forward and said, now we realize we were wrong to defend the pastor. We are going to call an independent investigation, and we are sorry for the way we've treated these women who've been brave enough to come forward. When I read that story, I grieved in my heart, and I thought to myself, what if four years ago, four years ago before it, it became the dirty laundry in the Chicago Tribune, the church had dealt with it decisively, 
What if that pastor had said, you know, I need to reflect on this. Maybe I am dealing with people in inappropriate ways and I need to confess it. What if? But now, it's been devastating to the Christian community. We evangelicals who've often pointed fingers at the Roman Catholics for their inability to handle indiscretions of that nature now realize that all of us are sinners under the hands of a just God. I tell that story for this reason. If you are hiding your sin, I plead with you to come and repent and confess your sins to God and possibly one or two trusted friends who love you so that you can receive the forgiveness of our God and be surrounded by His songs of victory. He goes on to say that God will counsel you. The blessing of forgiveness is that God counsels you. He says He counsels us with His eye upon us. If you're living with hidden guilt and sin, can you expect God's wisdom to come to you? Your heart is hard toward it. But if you open your heart, God will counsel you. His Word will speak to you. His Holy Spirit will help you apply His Word. He says, don't be like a horse or a mule. I laughed when I saw that. You think of a horse, you say, whoa, and you know, horses running off, you know, and you're trying to figure out how to catch them. And then the mule is the opposite. You're trying to drag that mule around, it's stubborn. And the Bible uses that image. You say, how do you control these beasts? With a bridle, a harness, a bit in the mouth to get them to do what you want to do? And what he's saying here is, don't be like a beast so that God in the weight of his heavy discipline has to put a bit in your mouth to get you to do what he wants you to do. Come willingly, seeking his face to be forgiven and enjoy the benefit of his counsel. Forgiveness is a joyful thing and God will provide His protection and His counsel. So we have a path to choose, don't we? Verses 10 and 11, which path will you choose? He says in verse 10, one path is toward wickedness, continuing to hide your sin and guilt, and that leads to sorrows. He's not just pretending here. He's he's serious. That is one pathway. And you could walk from this room and say, I'm not going to listen to this. I'm I'm going to protect myself. And I say out of the authority of the Word of God, sorrow is ahead. Or, he said, you can choose the path of confession and forgiveness and enjoy the steadfast love of the Lord surrounding you. Do you see the difference? The cool water on a sin-heated soul. The love of God surrounding you. And he goes on to say in verse 11, so be glad in the Lord, those of you who have experienced forgiveness. O righteous, shout for joy, you, you upright in heart. He speaks of the righteousness of God that's applied to our account on because of Christ. And he's saying, rejoice, rejoice that in the eyes of God, even though we're sinners, we're saved by His grace. And now when He looks at us, He sees us covered by the blood of His Son. Rejoice. Don't hide. Sometimes to be forgiven means you need to make restitution. To go back and say you're sorry. I've had to do this a number of times. It's painful, but it brings relief to apologize. Sometimes the sin is that we have a hard time forgiving someone else. I thought it was a little funny that in our Tuesday morning study, as we talked about this passage, the guys immediately went to how hard it is to forgive other people. And the passage is about coming clean ourselves and being forgiven. But that dawned on me then that maybe the biggest sin that we Christians carry is grudge, bitterness, anger towards someone else we think doesn't deserve to be forgiven. 
But when you come to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says at the end of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, if you will not forgive a brother or sister in Christ, I will not forgive you. What does that mean? I think he's speaking in the context of fellowship in this prayer. But he's saying, if you refuse to forgive another person who you don't think deserves to be forgiven, that breaks your fellowship with God. I was really helped. Sometimes you're helped by unusual things. Netflix has carried this series called The Crown about Queen Elizabeth. True story. And Queen Elizabeth had to take the throne when her father died. But before her father was king, his brother, King Edward VIII, was king. He abdicated the throne in 1936 because he wanted to marry a divorced American woman. So he gave up the throne, and his brother had to take over. His brother was not very confident and had a stuttering problem, and you've probably seen the king's speech. It came to light in the midst of this series on the crown that papers were discovered in the 1950s pointing to King Edward VIII, who is now the Duke of Windsor, having collaborated with the Nazis and with Adolf Hitler and betrayed his country. Secret papers that were revealed. And the queen had to deal with this uncle. And she could not forgive him for this dastardly deed. Billy Graham came to preach in London about this time. And as he was preaching and the queen was watching on television, she said, would you see if Billy Graham will come and visit me? Well, I can imagine when Billy Graham got an invitation to come to the queen, <laughs> he accepted readily. And it portrays Billy Graham coming and talking to the queen. And the queen asks him, what if you can't forgive someone because they don't deserve to be forgiven? And I thought Billy Graham's answer, which I'm assuming is accurate, he said, well, you know, the Bible says that we have to forgive. God commands us to forgive. She said, but, I, but what if they don't deserve it? And Billy Graham said this. Then he said, this is what Scripture says. First of all, we come to God and we confess our own sins. We need to be forgiven ourselves. And then, having been forgiven, we ask God to give us the strength to forgive others. And I thought, that's right. It's only when we contemplate the horrible offense that we owe God because of our sin and the substitute that Jesus was for us that we then can forgive others. I am not saying by forgiveness that we have to reconcile with someone who hurt us. Please hear me well. We may need to talk about what reconciliation means and doesn't mean. Forgiveness is not going to a person to say, I forgive you. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying to God, I am not going to hold this against this person any longer. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to load it on you, Lord. I'm going to place it on the cross with Christ. And I'm going to set that person free in my own heart. That does not mean, especially in the case of someone who's been abused, that you have to go back to your abuser and tell them you forgive them. No, no, nothing could be further from the case. All I'm saying is God tells us to release them through forgiveness so that we can experience the forgiving power of Jesus. Now, in the crown, the next scene is the queen in her private chapel on her knees confessing her sins to God. And I thought, oh, what a beautiful picture of someone who is quick to run to God to confess her sin of a lack of forgiveness. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the sin that may be gripping us most of all is the bitterness, the grudges, the hatred we feel, even as Christians, because of people who have hurt us. And today the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, come, confess that sin to me and be forgiven and released. Now this is the way we're going to conclude this service. There's a song called, Come to the Altar. 
This song reflects the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God who died in our place. It's basically a song that means, come to Jesus. We've got the cross here, and we've got an area that we're going to provide. We've got people who will come and pray with you. If you feel the Lord tugging at you and you say, you know, I've got to confess my sins today, we will provide that time. Even as we're singing, come to the altar. That might be a good time to come, or maybe after the service is over. But we feel like this is so important that we offer this invitation because my brothers and sisters in Christ, men and women, girls and boys, you can enter in to the blessing of forgiveness, knowing your sins are lifted from your shoulders and the cool water of the Holy Spirit cleansing your heat-starved soul. And that's my prayer. So let's stand. Let's stand and sing. And if you want to come forward now, you can do it. You can wait till after the service. But let's have a time of turning to the Lord in prayer. Welcome to Stonebridge Church. I'm Katie, and I'm glad you took a minute to check us out today. Stonebridge is a family. It's a place where people from all walks of life come together to celebrate the hope of Jesus, connect with one another, and share their gifts to bless others. Our weekend services are a casual atmosphere where you can learn more about Jesus through contemporary music, authentic prayer, and relevant Bible teaching. There are no perfect people here, just people seeking to know more about Jesus. No importa tu edad, donde ha estado, ni lo que ha pasado en tu vida. Todos son bienvenidos aquí. Each week, children, youth, and adults meet in classes and groups to connect with one another and learn how to take their next step with Jesus. Just like in any other family, sometimes we have struggles in life we don't know how to face. Our dedicated group of biblical counselors meets weekly with people to provide biblical guidance for life's challenges. We'd love to have you join us. See you soon.